on the call, I can kind of see who's on, uh, knows a lot about Colorado Business Roundtable. We are an organization that unapologetically tells the story that business is good, and we represent the private sector. In particular, uh, some larger employers that have interests not only in Colorado, Colorado public policy issues, national issues, and some international issues as well. So want to thank everyone for their partnership and support of Colorado Business Roundtable. Um, if you haven't seen already, we're actually having a webinar next week, uh, welcoming Ambassador Rima, Her Royal Highness Princess Rima, to Colorado virtually with a really interesting panel of nine um, women from the business sector, academia, and philanthropy. Oh, there's Senator Gardner. All right. Yeah, sorry. I'd scare you. <laughs> Jump in on this uh, Zoom conversation. I was trying to kill time. Welcome, Senator. It's so great to see you. Well, thank you. I apologize. I'm running late. I was on a, a conference call with a number of concessionaires at Denver International Airport, which, as you can imagine, is a pretty difficult challenge. There's no curbside pickup for restaurants at Terminal B. So uh, it's, uh, you know, they're facing even more challenges than perhaps uh, the other challenges, many challenges that we face. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we jump in, I'd love to introduce you to some of the folks on the call, and then we Hi. send it over to you for remarks, if that's okay. You bet. Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. So on, uh, we've, we've added some people to the conversation um, that are going to be watching um, through video, and then we've got some attendees that are watching through the webinar function that are watching and listening and able to add some questions through the chat feature. So we've got Ray Johnson, um, hey, IBM Ray. Corporate Social Responsibility Manager. Senator. Ray, you're looking good. How long did that take you? <laughs> I started when they told me I had to stay home from work in March, Senator. Nice. <laughs> I'd have like three whiskers. That's all I'd get. <laughs> so impressive. Uh, Kathy Barsner, Executive Director of NAOP yeah. Colorado. How are you? I was on the phone with Achilles the other day. Awesome. Awesome. Good to see you. Good to see you. Perfect. Chris Jensen, who's on our board, and he's also the manager and director for Chase. Thank you. Hey, Senator Thanks. Abbeo. Nice to see and you. And I just paid my credit card bill the other day, so. Thank you. <laughs> we'll give you he already credit. knows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. And then Franny Matthews, president and CTO of Colorado Technology Association. Franny, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. You've got a great back. All of you have great background. Oh, yeah, like, this is my, the, there's the real deal. That's oh, it. okay. I thought, that's nice. I got it. I got it for Christmas and my kids were like, what is that? And now that's they're like, where do you get awesome. it? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have to count on Franny. If you can't have a technology, you know, advantage on all of us, then we're in big trouble. So that's really nice, Franny. So uh, I, we've got other folks listening. So I want to just give a brief introduction for Senator Gardner. Uh, I suspect everybody knows a lot about your background by now. And if not, we'll, we'll give them a little bit of reminder and then we'll ask you to give some remarks. But um, we're really honored that you're able to join us today. We know that you've got an incredibly busy schedule and some of the work that you've been doing in particular on economic recovery and um, some other work, some really historic work on conservation efforts. We're excited to hear all about that. Um, but, if, if, but if you don't already know, Corey Gardner is a fifth generation Coloradan who was born and raised in Yuma, which is a small town on the Eastern Plains of Colorado, mm -hmm. where his family owned a farm implement dealership for over a century. And in fact, he lives in the same house that his great grandparents lived in. So um, that's pretty, pretty remarkable. After some time in the private sector, Corey began serving as an elected official, first in the Colorado House of Representatives and then elected to Congress in 2010. In the Senate, Senator Gardner continues to pursue common sense energy policy as a member of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition, Corey serves on the Foreign Relations Committee and the Commerce Science and Transportation Committee. He also serves as chairman of the subcommittee on East Asia, the Pacific and International Cybersecurity Policy. In 2020, Corey was ranked the third most bipartisan senator by the Luger Center for his work in the 116th Congress to build consensus, elevate the tenor of debate, practice civility, and advance legislation on pressing issues. Um, one of the things I think is most remarkable about Senator Gardner in particular, and something that's very Coloradan, is his ability to work on bipartisan issues, get stuff done, and actually advance um, problem-solving techniques for on behalf of Coloradans like us. So 
we're really honored that he represents us um, every day in the, the U.S. Senate. And I want to welcome uh, Senator Gardner for, to kick us off. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Debbie. Thanks for having me and uh, appreciate the opportunity. And uh, more importantly, thank you for the work that you all do creating jobs and opportunity for uh, people across Colorado. And uh, the challenges that you face are real and significant. Uh, and uh, particularly with the health pandemic that has led to an economic uh, challenge of magnitudes we haven't seen in our lifetimes. Uh, thank you for what you're doing to work through it, to fight through it, and to get the state and our country back on track. There continues to be three. And so I, so with that said, I hope that you're all well, staying healthy, staying safe, and uh, continue to know that we will get through this together. So thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, I continue to focus on three things. Uh, obviously, as we get through this health pandemic and get our economy moving forward, we have to do it responsibly. We have to do it safely. We have to do it with the best guidances and best practices that we can put together. Three things that we need to do. Number one, we have to continue to stop the spread of COVID-19. We do that with continued efforts on uh, uh, research and science and treatments and vaccines. We continue to do that with legislation that I've introduced today called the TEST Act, bipartisan legislation that has the support of, uh, you know, an incredible array of, of uh, science, science organizations as well as business organizations. This is about testing, this long-term testing strategies and plans. This is about uh, reporting and tracing and how we're going to make sure that we go from identifying hot spots and stopping the hot spot before it turns into an outbreak and working with the states and the federal agencies to do just that. The second thing we have to do is, of course, to help individuals who are, uh, you know, again, you see the unemployment numbers, 19 million people continuing in unemployment benefits, 47 million have made claims over the last several months uh, for unemployment. Colorado has a 10.2% unemployment rate. Remember when we were on these calls, and we would talk about how difficult it is to hire people when there's 1.9% unemployment, 1.7% unemployment. Well, won't it be nice when we can get back to the days of complaining about the difficulty of hiring people because the job market is so tight again, uh, because people are all back to work. So we have to help people who are struggling with mortgage and rent and um, putting food on the table, make sure they're okay. That's the second thing. Number three, of course, is the responsibly and safely uh, and science guided openings of businesses. Uh, that we can uh, get it, get get accomplished uh, across the state. We have to do all three things at the same time. These are not three things that you do in isolation. We got to do all three things at the same time. So that's what I continue to focus on. Again, I mentioned the bill that we're introducing today, bipartisan bill with Senator Bennett, uh, called the Test Act, uh, to do just that. Um, we've also are going to be focusing on a on a fourth uh, package of relief. I believe. Hopefully, we'll see that in mid July. Uh, the efforts to include a, a major infrastructure component of that. I'd like to see that infrastructure not just be roads and bridges, but also include some of the changes we need uh, to the Paycheck Protection Program, some of the opportunities to provide additional relief to things like the concessionaires uh, and others like that, but also water infrastructure, projects like the Arkansas Lake Conduit, uh, broadband infrastructure, those kinds of things I hope to be uh, see included in there. I also just introduced a bill yesterday to expand the Paycheck Protection Program uh, to uh, December 31st. Uh, we've expanded it to August 8th. I'd like to see that to December 31st. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd also like to see businesses be able to go back into it uh, and get additional dollars reloaded onto their loan. Uh, and uh, I'd like to see additional things being allowed for eligible expenses. If you're a restaurant, then I'd like to see the, the dollars that you had to throw away because you had to close your restaurant. I'd like to see that become part of the reimburse the Paycheck Protection Program or the dollars that you have to spend to reopen the restaurant because it takes money to stock up an inventory uh, that you just threw away four months ago because you were required to close. Uh, and so let's get that included in there. Uh, let's, uh, you know, we've made some other common sense changes to it that will help restaurants that we're going to continue to. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that we, that we, get, we have another bill that we introduced uh, called the Restaurant Act, which would help concessionaires it would provide $120 billion for restaurants itself. Uh, and we have many other pieces of legislation uh, moving forward on that front. Um, very, very excited two weeks ago to pass another key part that, you know, when we introduced this bill uh, and, and put it together, it was not intended to be a pandemic relief package. It was intended to do the most significant progress and work on conservation this country has seen in over 50 years, the Great American Outdoors Act. It just so happens though, that this legislation will create over 100,000 jobs around the country, thousands of jobs in Colorado, and that's just on the national park side alone. It will support between 16 and 30 jobs for every $1 million that we spend on the, national, on the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And we're gonna put $900 million a year 
into the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So the Great American Outdoors Act is the combination of two crown jewel ideas. Uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which has been our premier conservation uh, law since 1965, uh, and the, the Restore Our Parks Act, which will set aside uh, dollars from energy development, just like the Land and Water Conservation Fund does, uh, to catch up with the maintenance backlog at our national parks, to give you, and, and our national forests, and our Bureau of Land Management lands, and our Fish and Wildlife lands, to give you an idea of what this means in Colorado. We have over half a billion dollars in maintenance backlogs between our national parks and our forests. And this will put a huge dent in catching up with that maintenance, which means like if you're a campground over by Empire, Colorado, the Mitzpah pack, uh, campground, Mitzpah campground had a flood 10 years ago that wiped out the culvert and the bridge 10 years ago. It's inaccessible. You still can't get to it. This will help rebuild those kinds of things, restore our maintenance, uh, create jobs and opportunity and protect our environment. So, uh, it's a, it was huge bipartisan success, uh, passed overwhelmingly. The president said he would sign it. Uh, the Senate, excuse me, the House is going to mark it up and vote, excuse me, vote on it uh, at the end of this month, July. It's already July. Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so the, the House is going to be voting on it at the end of July, and I'm excited to see this move forward. So uh, there's a lot of work that needs to get done that has to get done in addition to uh, some of the other very important issues uh, of our time uh, and uh, moving forward to, to get this country back on track, bring our country together. Uh, put the division aside uh, by, because we solved uh, the, the challenges that have brought that division and create opportunities for all. So that's what we need to continue to do. Thank you, Senator Gardner. So well said. Um, typically, we spend most of our time talking about creating jobs and, talk, and e economy. And particularly, your Great American Outdoors Act is so interesting because Colorado relies on tourism dollars. And the reason businesses grow and want to come here is because of quality of life issues. So it's so intertwined. So that piece of legislation is incredibly interesting and in how historic it is and really sort of setting an interesting tone, I think, for moving forward on conservation issues. Well, you know, it was neat because I read on the Senate floor a quote by uh, a guy named Enos Mills, who was uh, the, the father of Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he said something like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher the quote, but it was something like this. He said, and I, and I read it because I thought it was appropriate for the times. He said, you know, the trail gives us a chance to be with nature, to be at one with the universe. It's on the trail that gives us courage and hope and uh, a chance to think. And it's on the trail that gives you that kind of peace that tends to make one kind. And I thought if there was ever a time and a need for more kindness in our country, uh, it's now. So it was a neat thing to be sharing with the, with the, the American people. Yeah, thank you so much. I wanna open it up to some of the folks I invited to have a conversation with you today. And Kathy, do you wanna kick it off with a question and then we'll see who else wants to jump in? Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you for that update, Senator. Um, it's always so good to hear what you're doing there uh, that benefits us here in Colorado. Um, specific to the pandemic, um, do you see any movement on any type of a federal insurance program to assist with business interruption and potential liability insurance in regard to this or future pandemics, similar to the terrorist risk insurance that came about after 9-11? Yeah, so, so that was an idea that, uh, that I had really kind of started talking about uh, uh, early on when we started hearing that business continuity insurance and business interruption insurance was not going to be uh, accessible. Uh, and if it was, it was like for a day or two and, and you know, that was it. So um, we've had a lot of conversations about that. We've had significant conversations with some of the insurers who were involved in the terrorism reassurance, reinsurance program, TRIA. And they, they, you know, they've identified some of the challenges between modeling for a terrorist attack versus modeling for a pandemic and what it means. And so uh, they've been very helpful in coming up with some different ideas. So uh, the answer is it's very much a conversation that continues. I think it is the right conversation to have because that money off of the sidelines would be very good to get off the sidelines and into the system in addition to the government uh, support that has been provided. So um, you know, I think they brought up some really good points that I hadn't thought about when I first uh, started pushing this idea. Uh, and uh, I think we can all come to a way, I, hopefully, uh, we'll get to a solution that will work. Uh, you know, maybe it's not exactly like uh, TRIA, but it's an idea that, that can get some, some uh, uh, of that burden sharing that we thought we were buying insurance for. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Chris, you, you want to weigh in? Any questions or comments for Senator, Senator Gardner? 
Sure, thanks, Senator. Appreciate uh, all you do for our state. And uh, indeed, uh, one of the silver linings of quarantine is that we live in Colorado. We get a chance to go outside and, and have a background like the one you're sharing right exactly. there. <laughs> Beautiful, and it clears the mind and clears the soul. Um, yeah. Being the banker on the call, I'd love to hear a little bit more uh, about the payroll protection program. You should know that um, our chief economist has from day one said that it was really well designed. And according to his analysis, it should uh, be enough money to keep 50 million people on the payroll. Um, we see that the new jobs claims today were, uh, you know, new jobs were up about 5 million, 4.8 million. Um, unemployment's still very high at 11. Uh, is, is it working? Um, I appreciate your comments on the modifications that you think need to be made and what happens when it runs out. And uh, I'd love to hear, just elaborate a little bit more on, on, on that program and how how it can evolve to be a strength that it is for small business. And then just a comment, it looks like the, the demand for Main Street lending is not very robust. Should that be modified also? Yeah, a couple of things. So on the Main Street, Main Street lending side of things, it's, it's, I'm meeting with Secretary Mnuchin right after we get off of this call uh, to talk about a couple of things Zing, that I hope to be included, have included in the next uh, package. Uh, and Main Street lending is something that I think has become a challenge. They Secretary Mnuchin believes that, and, and, and I've heard him say this before, that this is the most difficult and complex component of the relief package that they have tried to put together. So I think that complexity is still a challenge for them. I think there's a recourse, non-recourse part of the, of the loan that makes it a challenge and maybe an obstacle to lenders to want to get involved with because of that 5% obligation that they may be stuck with. They don't know how it's going to go. Uh, there has been limited utility in some of them because of the way state laws are structured. Uh, on the state lending side, because if a state has uh, opportunities to get some of the money and they have to on lend to other organizations, well, or municipalities, well, we have certain constitutional restrictions that may prohibit Colorado from doing that. So, um, you know, that has been a utility that they, the state can't use or municipalities aren't able to use because of that. State. I, I do think they have to figure out how to make it more usable because it is an incredible uh, opportunity for. Uh, additional financing if they can get it right and start getting those dollars out the door. But Chris, I share your concerns and I'll, I'll bring that up to Secretary Mnuchin as well, uh, that, it, that perhaps uh, it needs to be rethought to make it more, more, more utilized. Well, I think, uh, Senator, yeah, right. if I might, yeah. um, I think one thing that you hit on is that there's a risk sharing and in yep. a time when the risk premiums have increased yeah. tremendously, banks are not you know, very eager to take on high risk loans that they'll be on the hook for. So that's, that's right. That's the problem. It puts us in a difficult position. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so that's, uh, I know a, a big concern that I've heard from a lot of lenders as well. Uh, it, it, you know, not, not just yourself, but many. And so I'll, I'm going to continue that conversation with them on the paycheck protection program and some of the other loan improvements. We have about $130 billion remaining mm -hmm. in the paycheck protection program. Part of the reason is because they came out with some of some very crazy restrictions that made people think twice about it. Uh, and, you know, and so they started returning money because they weren't sure if they were going to be found uh, in compliance or not with it. And uh, so, so, you know, and then the 75-25 split that they initially started with, we got it changed to 60-40 now, but that created a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so, so my legislation is trying to open up some, I, some ways that you can spend the money, the way you can access the money, uh, get it, this extended beyond the application date. Now it's extended, at least that the, the, the Senate passed the August 8th. Uh, I'd like to see it extended out to the December 31st, um, you know, because if we do start to see a rollback in, in uh, guidance, in, in restrictions again, or I guess not a rollback, but a, a roll forward now of new restrictions, this is going to provide longer term impact. And so we need to have those dollars that are out there again, available and still available to keep people employed, keep people in business and moving forward. So, uh, you know, I'd like to cover additional expenses. I'd like to cover some more with $130 billion, let's, let's let C6s, 501 C6s into the program. We should do that. So I think that's important. Um, and we have legislation to do that that we've introduced, but uh, let's get that included in the next package, allow it to go with this money. So those are things that we need to, to work on. Um, you know, we have to build the confidence in the economy. Without, without confidence in the economy, we won't have an economy. Uh, and so things like the TEST Act that put those, that confidence measures in place, that will really, really help. Uh, the guidance is the more clear they are, the better they help. We've got to work on liability reform and some other issues to make sure that this uh, is working forward. Keep up the good work. Thanks.
Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Debbie, if I could just throw in to um, build on what Chris said. Um, so our national association covers about 20,000 members and we've done monthly surveys on how they feel about COVID. And it's good to see that you're looking at more long-term um, assistance because most of them in the survey that we did in June, 70% um, of the respondents said this will impact their business for the next 12 months. Another 15% said up to 18 months. So while the economy is, is slowly beginning to come back, this is gonna be a long-term impact. Like for our association, we're looking at financial impacts, not as bad this year, but more devastating next year. Yeah, as loans are being released and how that's a re, 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 released, I guess, for loans, as leases are being released and loans are being reconsidered, those kinds of things, yeah. Yeah, um, Kathy, we did a similar um, uh, survey of, of tech-centric um, companies in Colorado and mostly C-levels, uh, about 50% were CEOs. And what we found was that there's an optimism in tech and they're seeing opportunities to grow. And I, and we, we've seen that in a lot of instances where there's actually been an increase in revenues, but they're holding back uh, dramatically on, on um, uh, employment and it's all around uncertainty. That is, so anything that can, can bring it to a longer range uh, time of certainty, I think um, yeah. will help kind of kickstart stuff. Yeah. And, you know, and I spoke to the general manager of the Gaylord uh, Rockies out by Denver International Airport. They had 1,400 employees uh, and uh, they are now back to about 300 employees. Uh, but the challenge they have is people are calling for that convention that they've been planning for a long time in 2021. You know, and, and that certainty is like, so can you tell me what the governor or the local health department or the president or whatever is going to be doing on, uh, you know, how many people I can have in a room in February of 2021? Well, nobody can predict that. That goes to that, that uncertainty and the challenge. That's just so difficult to deal with. Yeah. yeah. Great. That's a good segue. Uh, Franny, any feedback or comments for Senator Gardner? And then we'll go to Ray. Yeah, that, um, you know, one of the things that we saw, um, I, I'm proud to say that Colorado businesses pivot very quickly when we went back, uh, were, you know, stay at home orders. And we saw, you know, people being productive in their home offices. Um, but we still have a huge problem with broadband ubiquitously yeah. covered in Colorado. Can you speak to that? I think we've got about 14% of our rural households still not able to access high speed? Yeah, absolutely. So as a rural Colorado, and this is near and dear to my heart, you've probably heard me make the joke many, many times that I can find uh, five bars in my hometown. I just can't find five bars on my cell phone. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we need to make sure that we have that level of connectivity. And, you know, I've done live TV interviews uh, on national news from my home in Little Yuma, Colorado. So we have made improvements, but we have to do better. Uh, and uh, so one of the ideas that I put forward uh, several years ago was a bill called the Airwaves Act. This is a bill that would get more spectrum sold by the, because the federal government holds on to the spectrum. So you, you, you have these auctions for the spectrum. And then we set aside a 10% or so of the proceeds or more for a rural broadband deployment, underdeveloped uh, areas deployment. And that can generate, just based on our last spectrum auction, that could generate as much as uh, six, seven, eight billion dollars uh, for broadband uh, development and deployment. So, uh, but obviously we need it now, right? Uh, and it'd be nice to have those jobs uh, putting fiber in the ground now. So we, we are working on legislation that would do this to allow the FCC to advance fund that rural dividend. We know we're going to have the spectrum auction. So let's go ahead and let the FCC uh, out of other existing funds put forward seven, eight billion dollars now. And then they can pay themselves back out of the money that they receive from the spectrum auction. So I think uh, we're, we're really close to getting that legislation fine-tuned across the various areas of funding that the FCC has uh, to allow them the authority to do that. So that's just one idea of many. You know, we need one dig. I mean, if you're digging a hole on the side of a road, you better be dropping fiber in it at the same time uh, and uh, those kinds of things. So that one dig policy, uh, uh, that connect, uh, all of those things together, we need to uh, promote and, and get going. And I actually have uh, Senator, a follow-up question before I turn it over to Ray. Similar to that, on um, you had mentioned fiber and communications technology, perhaps in the next infrastructure stimulus bill. 
And a follow-up question I just received from um, someone who's, who's watching as well, wanted a little more information about that. He may have misheard the opening comments, but he, he mentioned it sounded like the Senate may combine two legislative actions, uh, pandemic and infrastructure stimulus together. And he wanted some additional thoughts on the timing and scope of the next round of these relief investments, particularly your thoughts on backfill for state and local revenues, but also your um, thoughts on infrastructure stimulus, both yeah. in timing and scope. So that's a big question, but. Yeah, it is a big question. So <laughs> if I understand the question right, and I'll try to answer it uh, the way I understood a it. A couple is, questions, uh, I think. Yeah, the, the, so I hope that the next package of relief uh, includes infrastructure. So that's what I'm hoping that it would do. So we're looking at, you know, the highway bill, those kinds of things, the infrastructure that I talked about on broadband development, the rural funding for undeveloped and underdeveloped areas. I hope that that's included in that. Um, I think the, uh, my hope is that um, we have uh, the, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, all those things can be included in that. So that's, that's part of that, that relief uh, package, that relief effort, that long-term light at the end of the tunnel job creation. Uh, as far as revenue backfills for local governments, I think on April 16th, I sent a letter with uh, Governor Polis and Senator Bennett uh, to Secretary uh, Mnuchin, as well as uh, Leader Schumer and Leader McConnell, uh, asking that we move forward with uh, uh, with about $500 billion in relief for uh, states and uh, federal governments, excuse me, state and local governments, excuse me, uh, without a population cap so that we can make sure that small cities, uh, small towns are able to get it just as big towns are. Uh, and uh, to be able to use that for for flexible revenue back for purposes. So I think uh, we've continued to push for that over the last uh, several months and we will continue to push going forward. Hopefully something like that will be included in the next package as well, along with that infrastructure idea. And I know the timing yeah. is sort of a moving target. You know, timing is is kind of a, you know, anyone's guess, but do you have a sense of timing for that infrastructure relief package that's so I, I hope that you know we we were in the middle of the defense authorization act right now and unfortunately we're not going to be able to wrap uh, that up before the uh, work period in july um so we're, we'll come back we'll get the defense authorization authorization act done and then my guess is and i hope that that's the package we turn to after that so okay. sometime in july perfect thank you um ray johnson yes Take it away. Senator, senator thanks so hey, much you, you, thanks so much for your time today. This, is, this has been uh, outstanding and some great, great information for us all. Um, I, I want to build on uh, what Franny and Debbie were talking about it and one of the questions we had about broadband. But before I do that, I want to just make a quick comment on something not even related to the pandemic, uh, which obviously was in the works long before the pandemic hit us. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. Thank you because we hit a milestone yesterday with the USMCA. Uh, yes, the implementation, right. Yep, going into effect. And um, I know you were a, a big supporter and a big help to get that through. And I know that's still, um, and, and maybe, you know, we don't think of it, but even with the pandemic now, how important that probably is to Colorado um, and jobs and, and the economy and those kinds of things as well. Um, and, and what, from an IBM's perspective, the real key point to that um, uh, passing and, and going into effect was the digital trade aspect, because to us, that's huge. And we, we, we thought that the digital trade aspect was fantastic. Um, and we think that it's a wonderful, wonderful framework for future trade agreements as well. Um, so I just want to thank you on that. But then getting back to the broadband, I think one thing we're learning from this pandemic, I think it's already been there, but it's bringing more to the forefront is, uh, and maybe the silver lining of some of this, but it gets back to the broadband issue is, you know, we're putting more and more emphasis on digital learning um, yeah. out of necessity. And I think because of that, um, broadband becomes, you know, a bigger issue. They have more people have access to digital learning. Now that's not going to solve everything when it comes to, you know, students being able to take classes online because there's a lot of factors involved. But broadband certainly a, a part of that for, from it comes from a education and workforce reskilling whatever whatever you want to call it. Um, so I know uh, you've been a big advocate for that, and I'd just like to know your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, we need to make sure that our our reskilling ideas, uh, reskilling programs, 
uh, are refined by new ideas of making it easier to access and that more uh, funding can be put toward those accesses. Uh, you know, uh, we've worked on Pell Grants and things like that to be able to go to more programs. We've worked with the Ecuador Technology uh, Association on legislation that would empower apprenticeships and the Chance in Tech Act to make sure that we're, and work with you, Ray, on this at IBM uh, to, to make sure that we have these chances to uh, get more people involved from high school to college uh, into these kinds of careers, allowing more flexibility in the way not only federal programs like Pell Grants can be used, but federal uh, savings accounts for different programs that can be used for apprenticeships and those kind of ideas. And we ought to make it easier to, to get into reskilling. And we need to use this chance uh, to retool. Because look, I mean, the future, the future of education is going to be, it's, it's not, all right, I, gotta need a, I need to do something else. It's another four years. No, it's going to be your degree 1.0, 2.0, 2.3, 2.5, 3.0. I mean, you're going to have to be doing that as we go. And it's going to have to be delivered over a matter of days and weeks, not years and years. Uh, and so, and that's going to be digitally, right? So um, I think the CARES Act did some good things in providing funding for that. I think we got to continue to help support that more. I remember, like, <laughs> won't name names, no names. Um, the, there are certain cell phone companies whose maps are bright red for their coverage. Uh, and I know a lot of the areas that are bright red on the map, but are, uh, you know, a dark hole on the phone uh <laughs> so so they don't get anything so um when i went into our local uh local viera wireless store because the one of the other national carriers did not cover my town sufficiently even though the map was red uh i said i need a uh i need a, a hot spot and they said we're sold out sold out yeah. and you know uh, and, I, and I thought, oh, yeah, I said, because a lot of people that live in these rural areas had the same thing that I did, right? All of a sudden, they, they need more uh, communication, connectivity, bandwidth for their kids. They're going to be learning from home. And so everybody came into the local Viero store uh, trying to figure out how they could have mobility, how they could have the, the Mophi, the Wi-Fi, the whatever you want to call it. Uh, and uh, so um, and as I'm saying that, a notice pops up that says your Internet connection is unstable. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> can hear me. Uh, anyway, um, so those are the kinds of things that we, that we need to continue to work on uh, and uh, to make sure that as we get to this uh, ability to teach and reach uh, digitally, that we have the connectivity that goes along with it. Perfect. Um, we have another question that popped in from the panel about um, manufacturing. And the question is from Tom Bugnets with Manufacturers Edge. And he wants to know, do you see any legislation on the horizon to promote reshoring of critical manufacturing or incentives to reshore non-critical supply chains? And Tom, yeah, hey, Tom how are you? Good to, he's good to have the question. also thanking you for all your good work, so. Oh my gosh, thank you, yeah. thank you. Well, um, look, I, yes, there is. I think you'll start, you've started to see some of this legislation. Um, I, I think Marsha Blackburn has a bill, Tom Cotton may have a bill. You know, I, I haven't had a chance to look at them yet to see where they go or how far they go or the approach they take, but. Uh, you know, I was talking to a couple of my colleagues yesterday about the need uh, to figure out how, how, we, how we are better. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you don't, we need to have these industries here in the United States, right? We don't need to do it because the government's reset, all right, we have a mandate that you're coming to the United States and you must do business here. We need to have these businesses coming to the United States because it's the best doggone place in the world to do business. Uh, we need to have the best regulatory environment, the best tax environment, the best competition and competitive environment. Uh, we need to have businesses in the United States because we have free trade agreements with uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership. We have free trade agreements with ASEAN because we've had a free trade agreement with the EU uh, in place. So let's get this stuff done. And then supply chain issues kind of take care of itself, uh, you know, because all of a sudden, gosh, who doesn't want to do business here? And then we do have to make sure from a, uh, a, a, a you know, medical equipment point of view, those kind of things that you know, people understand that perhaps being over-reliant on any one nation for goods is not a good policy because in a moment of a global pandemic, it doesn't matter who you are, you can be China or Great Britain, uh, if you're reliant on that country and they're also affected by whatever virus it is, that's not a good thing. And so how do we make sure that we are resilient, that we have the supply chain here because of the environment that we're in uh, and the good economy that we face here? And you know, I've got a, a bill idea that we, that we you know, Woodward in Colorado, I'll just use them as an example. I'm not using them because I've talked to them about this. I have not. So this is a, don't, don't blame them for this idea. Uh, so, so let's say that they wanted to convert to making ventilators. Uh, if they did that, they'd have to get their ventilator approved. They'd have to get their manufacturing process approved. The FDA, pro everything would have to be, and it takes time, right? 
Well, let's allow, and Tom, you and I have talked about this before, let's allow manufacturers to get pre-approval from the FDA and whoever else it is for the manufacturing process so that at that moment's need, they can immediately flip a switch and start making ventilators or gowns or masks or whatever it is. Uh, they've already got their FDA approval, the design's approved, the equipment's approved, the manufacturing process is approved. So we don't have to go through months and months while they ramp up, to get it done. So those are the kinds of things that we also ought to be looking at supply chain up and down, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's the medical device side or the pharmaceutical side or the manufacturing processes that make cotton swabs, those kinds of things. Perfect. And Senator, we know that you have a hard stop. You've got a really important meeting. Gotta go catch up with Secretary Mnuchin. Yep, you got it. <laughs> Absolutely. If, um, if our partners, you, you and your staff have been incredibly gracious with making sure businesses in Colorado know what resources are available, what's happening with federal stimulus, federal response to the global pandemic and all the economic issues that follow, um, can I send out email uh, information for your staff if any of our partners have follow-up oh, questions do. for you? Yeah. Do you have that or do you need it? Well, is that Leah? Should I send them towards Leah? Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Leah, uh, you're going to get the emails. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> she's, she's, she's a bit, she, that's her job. She's been that's incredibly right. helpful right. on behalf of your office to the business community. But um, we know that you have a hard stop. Um, we just want to thank everybody on behalf of Colorado Business Roundtable for coming for this briefing. And Senator, if you have a kind of a final word to leave us with, we'll give you the final word. No, again, thank you. Just thanks for the jobs that you create. Thanks for uh, trying to work so hard to get back on track and we will together. Just uh, know that you've got uh, an open door here and an office that wants to help in every way we can uh, to help you in that endeavor because uh, we are all in this together and Colorado is such an incredibly blessed state for the people and the place that it is. So uh, thank you very much uh, for all of your support and uh, work on this together. We'll get through it. So thanks and uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk to you soon in person, I hope. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator, for all you do. We, we're honored to have you here today. Appreciate you. Thank and you so much. Thanks, thanks, everyone, for joining in. And that concludes our call. Appreciate thanks, your time. Baby. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank you.